Hello, everybody. Um, so many of you want uh, to draw the face. We all do, because we're human beings and we like to look at other human beings and we like to get a likeness. It's actually very difficult, isn't it? Um, because this is a bit of paper and it's two-dimensional and yet our heads, our bodies, we are three-dimensional. So here's the thing. We've got to learn a few tricks. I think that's the simplest way of putting it. The trick of how to trick the eye and brain into seeing something three-dimensional, which is in fact two-dimensional. Since we were tiny whiny, we all wanted and learned to draw the face. And we did something like that. And actually, people get away with just being a little bit fancier with that. They do little things that make it look a little bit more sophisticated, but basically, it's still uh, 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 uh. Actually, human beings respond, and monkeys and other thing, creatures, respond to that funny little symbol. So it's dead easy to make a face, as it were. But what's not so easy is to create a face or a head on a two-dimensional surface, which is, uh, creates the illusion of it occupying space. And to do that, we have to go back to the very origins of um, drawing, uh, uh, which is the thing like this. There's a two-dimensional uh, shape. Here's another two-dimensional shape. Just by joining that up, and maybe by adding a little bit of shadow here, we can create the illusion of a box. I'm sure you've all done this sort of thing. It's a kind of trick we learn when we're kids. But that's profound, profoundly interesting, because that creates in the brain of the viewer an illusion of space which they can't not see. You can't not see that as a box in space. That's something very valuable for us. And so I'm going to go on to talk about the head from early, from, from, from basic principles of three-dimensional illusion. First of all, however, we're going to really look at the skull. Here it is. Um, we've all got one. <laughs> and uh, this is a male skull. And by analyzing the shapes in here, because there's more than one shape, it's not just that oval with the dots. By analyzing that, I hope to show you how you can reconstruct from the skull outwards a living head face. OK? So let's look at this uh, and, and try to analyze the various parts. And I'll draw them as I describe them. The first is obvious. It's what's above my hand there. It's a sort of rugby ball shape, a sort of, uh, it's not exactly a sphere. It's, um, oh, what shall we say, that shape. Let's put it here. That kind of a shape. A flattened, grapefruity sort of shape. <laughs> call it what you like. We call that unit number one. And when you're drawing a head, I'd like you to be able to see that. Of course, there's hair here. It's sometimes difficult. But uh, you can discern the skull, especially around the forehead. Unless you're very unfortunate your forehead will be just bone under skin. That's unit number one. Now, unit number two would be what's below my hands here. It's made up of the mandible, your jawbone, and this, the maxilla. Mm, that's the bone that holds up your upper teeth. And together, they make what I would describe as a sort of round-fronted box. Round-fronted box. Box because there is an angle there. Feel it on your own chin. Um, you've only got about an inch or inch and a half that's facing forward. Your front few teeth, your chin. But then immediately it goes backwards. So like a box. Like that box I drew a few minutes ago, you'll find this re 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 retreating backwards like that there. So it's a round-fronted box. We'll call that number two. There it is there. Number three is complex but it makes or breaks your drawing, your construction, your reconstruction of the head. Run about where your eyebrows are, there's a ridge of bone. Some of us are more ridgy than others. 
men, male skulls tend to be, have more of a ridge than female skulls. But when we come to talk about the differences between male and female uh, uh, skulls, mm, you really need an expert to discern it uh, because there's tremendous variation. But we'll just say that we've all got this ridge above the eye. So let's put it in. There would be something like that there. We can modify this later. And here's very important, and not many people understand this. Uh, if you just uh, put your fingers either side or under your eyes, you'll feel a ridge of bone there. And it stops, of course, at the cheekbone. There it is there. The cheekbone. This is vitally important, and not a lot of people pay enough attention to it. Now, I have to wear specs, and if you look at the specs, spectacles, you'll see that the arm, or is it the leg of the spectacle, arm I think, leg, whatever it is, is at right angles to the lens. It's a, and that fits onto my skull, more or less. You, you must remember that right angle bend there. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. Right angle bend, going back to the ear uh, there, and there you can see excuse me, skull, you can see the auditory canal about there. So that's the middle of your ear. So that bone, it's called the zygomatic bone, lovely name. And this, I'm going to call the malar bone. The, between the two of them, they make a kind of, uh, well, it's like an American footballer's helmet. They've got these bars there to stop them, to protect them. So we've got that there. So we're going to call that, oh, and then we have this wonderful, shall we call it, bone, it is the orbital bone, and our eyeballs are, are fill it more or less perfectly. And when I come on to draw the face, you'll see how wonderfully uh, that fits in there. But we're just talking bones just now. So a slightly downward bending hollow there, there, and of course here. These are the orbital bones. So that's all, oh, and there's a wonderful sort of ridge starts to form in the in what was the spherical uh, cranium, it now starts to get a little boxed and there's a ridge of bone protecting our eyes on the side there and there and there. So there's one, there's two and now three is, the, is this complex around our eyes. The zygomatic arch, the malar bone and the orbital bones with the ridges above and below the eye, obviously to protect our eyes. Um, and then finally, uh, sticking out, sticking out into space here, doom, 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 some more sticky out than others, is the nasal bone. Well, the nasal bone, as you can see, is tiny whiny, but we've all got a, 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 a piece of a complex of cartilage there, which forms the human nose. But let's just put the cartilage and bone together for the sake of argument and make a a nose. There it is, like that there. Let me get a bit of white chalk, just to... Sticks out into space. And here's very important for we who are reconstructing the head. It sticks out at right angles, at right angles to the malar bone. So there was that ridge below our eye. The nose is at right angles to that. Uh, we must get these angles right. That's all you need to know. One, two, three, four. Four. There is perhaps a little bit of sophistication, because look how far out our teeth stick there, especially the upper teeth there, uh, the, 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 mac, the maxilla. So you could say there's an extra little unit there. And there's a thing called the nasolabial fold, where your cheek meets the, your, your mouth uh, flesh there, and that sort of defines it like this here. And your lips are there. We'll come back to that later. We'll come back to talking about the eye and all that there. But oh, and the ear. One, two, three, four, and if you like, a fifth sticking out like a little muzzle there. Five. So every time you draw the head, uh, and I'll draw it in different positions, but I'd like you to identify these five ears. It gets easier and easier. You can practice on the back of an envelope. You don't have to have an actual head in front of you. Just remember that it's no good just trying to do it in one. Mm -mm, mm -mm, it'll never work. What works is if you identify 
at least four, maybe five units. And that way, when you're doing a portrait, you can see how person A differs slightly from person B in all of these elements. So, of course, this is what you might call a three-quarter view, but the same principle applies when you're looking uh, straightforwardly at a, a figure. So let's show you what I mean. One would be the cranium from the front. Two would be that box of the jaw, the mandible and the maxilla, with that little bit that is the chin there. This is a rather masculine chin. One could make it softer. We could have a whole long discussion about the difference between male and female uh, uh, skeletons, skulls, but um, let's just go with this just now. Then there's the ridge above the eye. So there's one, there's two. The ridge above the eye, the orbital bone, oh, and the ridge below, sorry, the ridge below, which is narrower. The orbital bones, which contain the eyeball there and there. And the zygomatic arch, which you may remember goes back to the ear. There it is, there and there. And then here, sticking out at right angles, but still visible the both sides of it, the nose. We'll, we'll talk about that in greater detail in a, in, a, in a few minutes. And then the mouth with its particular separate unit that I talked about here. So you can see how the head from three quarter view, from frontal view and any uh, angle in between, you can still find these elements. And really, when you're doing a portrait, when you're drawing any figure, uh, and the same applies actually to the whole torso and limbs, look for the solid geometry, sphere, box, pyramid. Uh, they, they, th th this is how we can create the illusion of something two-dimensional, something three-dimensional on a two-dimensional surface. Something three-dimensional, our heads, on a two-dimensional surface. Right, earlier we talked about the solid geometry behind the skull. Uh, and that's how I think you should always uh, view whatever face you're looking at, uh, head you're looking at uh, before you or while you're uh, st setting the thing up. But of course, uh, uh, we are not just bones. We, uh, we have, uh, although the skull and all the body is a part where the bone is just under the skin. So we kind see our own skulls in our faces. But fortunately, we've got uh, flesh, muscle, cartilage, hair, uh, which complete the picture. They're sitting on top of that. But it is interesting to note that much of the skull is lying just under skin. And so that's why it's so important for us to know how a skull is constructed before uh, uh, we attempt to draw a portrait, shall we say, a, a human head head. All right, uh, so let's go back to where we, where we were. Um, uh, I'll just draw quickly that earlier drawing as I did before. There is a cranium, uh, there is a, let's put it here, there's a round fronted box like this, there is a ridge here, and a ridge below, that gives you your cheekbones. They go back at right angles to the ear. Just to protect, they protect the orbital bone like this, which contains the eyeball. And between them sticks out into space are very three-dimensional noses. Uh, do not forget, don't do a, a slice of cheese sort of nose. Always look for the bridge of the nose, which softens into a sort of lovely bulbous end like that, and the side of the nose. Side of the nose is very important. And then uh, we have the uh, maxilla bone, where the lips are. And I'm going to concentrate uh, in a minute or two on the eye and the, the um, lips. Just a minute. But there we are. There again, rather quickly, is the construction of the head of the skull. And now we can see how we can um, we can discern that which is not bone, put it that way. We want to be very, very sure that we know what is the side of something. There it is, the side of the nose, the side of the skull. Here, tone helps us tremendously. The side here, and actually there is a muscle deep in the skin there from the 
cheekbone to the corner of the mouth, which gives, and you sometimes see people who are very, very film starry, who've got a very sharply defined uh, angle there. Uh, uh, so we can see the edge of the head like this. So you, you really want to be constantly reminding yourself, what am I looking at? Am I looking at the front of something? Or the side of something? It's the side of the eye, would give me a shadow in this case. The, the front of the cheekbone would catch the light in this aspect, whereas the, um, the, suddenly it changes to go back in the zygomatic arch to the ear like this. So we find that tone helps us, doesn't it? Shadows help us to see something that looks, that creates the illusion of three dimensions. And no matter, no matter what I do, now I've done the thing that I suppose artists very often really want, they want that power to make you, the viewer, see that as something in three dimensions rather than just a series of smudges on a two-dimensional surface. You, they hope, cannot help, your brain cannot help, but see that in three dimensions. And the, you can carry on uh, with the anatomy and attitude, the figure, and you can see how that can carry on down uh, into the, 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 the torso. And we use all the tricks that an artist has uh, uh, in his or her uh, command to make things look like the way the world is uh, in three dimensions. Because we, in our perception, we have to do this constantly. We see the world around us and we are constantly taking uh, these two-dimensional patterns and because of clues like shadows, making it into the three-dimensional world that we know and enjoy. So there we are. Uh, I, I'm, now I think I should uh, uh, concentrate finally on uh, shall we say the mouth and the eye? Uh, that these are features that, when we're doing portraits, when we're doing images of people, because we're all human being, we so want to uh, stare at those elements of the skull that most communicate, that communicate most deeply: the eye, and to an extent, to the mouth. We've talked now about uh, about the. Uh, underlying principles of the skull, uh, the bones, and uh, I've said that we're very fortunate because the skull is uh, very apparent on the face. We can see bone just under skin, and whenever we're drawing the figure, uh, that's what we want to look out for, uh, where bone is just under the skin, because that gives us a clue, uh, and it helps us in this uh, ability to draw the illusion of three dimensions and two dimensions. But uh, it's not all about uh, structure uh, and bones. It, there's uh, uh, expressive elements that we want to be able to get good at. And um, the eye is particularly important, usually very badly drawn, and uh, uh, we really need to analyze it just to see all the different elements that go together to make the eye, the human eye. Uh, you will notice when you talk to somebody, that you look them in the eye and they don't really like being, we as a species don't really like being looked in the eye. So constantly our eyes are moving uh, are, uh, away from people or directly at people if we want to in emphasize something, but we're kind of shy of staring straight into somebody's eyes. And if you think of it like this, I, I think you'll understand why. You all know what a brain looks like. You see it on telly all the time. Uh, it's, oh, shall I do it? The brain, I think, you know, would look something like uh, this. And it's all made up of grey matter. There we are. La, 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 la. If you know a little bit more, you'll know that there's a central nervous system like that. that the, the brain. But actually, the brain has an extension here, there, and crossing over weirdly to two parts there and there. Now, don't all scream, the stuff of nightmares, but that is what our brain is really like. And as you can see, that's our eyeball. So when you look at somebody's eye, you're looking at their brain.
you're looking inside them. And people like to protect their innermost thoughts, which can often be, uh, uh, can often be revealed in how we say. And, uh, and it's somewhat the same with the mouth. When we open our mouths, uh, we allow people some vision of our insides. Um, so they're very precious and important uh, parts of our body. Uh, we need, as people who draw, we need to know all about it. So we get to stare because our job is to, um, is to reveal to people uh, expressive element, the expressive element of the human face. So let me start off with where I uh, was talking about the skull there. There is this ridge above the eye, and then there's the orbital bone. Uh, here it is, uh, slightly downward uh, leaning uh, cave of bone, you might say, uh, with that ridge above it and the malar bone, which is a ridge below it. So let's draw that in in a larger scale. Here we are, that lovely downward movement of the eye here and the malar bone below it. And uh, this is filled with the eyeball. The eyeball more or less fills that whole area. And there's that ridge of bone at the side. There, the malar bone and the rigomatic. So it more or less fills that space there. But as you know, uh, there's much more to it than that. Because our eyes are shaded by eyelids, the delicate tissue of the eye, it's called the sclera, the white of the eye, is um, protected uh, by our blinking, uh, the blinking of our eyelids, protected by bone here, 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 and the nasal bone there. Uh, and there is in the corner of an eye that delightful uh, uh, duct, tear duct, which if you're painting, you're always going to find this blood right up at the surface. So it's always a little pink or coral colored dot. Actually, there's a funny little thing there as well, which is the vestige that we have as human beings of that third eyelid that I know some animals have, lizards and birds. They've got an eyelid that can also cross the eyeball to clear the dust away from it in that way. We've lost that facility. But here then is the eyelid. Oof, there we are. It cuts sharp and crisp. If you do it in a wobbly way, it can't be right because uh, although our eyelids are very, very thin skin, the actual edge of the eyelid is actually got a bit of cartilage in it, it makes it very, very crisp. And then it reveals more or less, depending on how wide open our eyes are or how half shut our eyes are, it reveals the iris, there's the sclera, the iris, and the pupil, which will make this like this. But this tends to be darker in here. Uh, uh, and uh, let's just draw this in like this here. Now, uh, uh, um, most human beings have got, uh, in, in this world, have got brown irises, uh, not so different in tone from the, um, uh, from the pupil, which is, of course, the darkest thing in the body because it's actually sucking in light. It's allowing light into the back of the eye. Um, uh, but Northern Europeans, various brown, blue, green, gray-eyed people, you can see a greater distinction, obviously, between the pupil and the miraculous uh, muscle structure of the iris. So, uh, yes, so this pupil then is the darkest possible thing in the body because it is actively bringing in, sucking in light rays in, into the back of the uh, uh, eye within the skull. There's a ridge here, as I said, eyelashes there, eyebrows here. We're starting to find that the eye is now becoming much more um, interesting to look at. There is, as I say, that little pink duct there in the corner of the eye. We have uh, a very bright sclera, the white of the eye like this. Indeed, the, the lower eyelid, whoo, let's sit here, the lower eyelid can catch that light sometimes uh, because it's very often wet with tears and it gl glints a little bit. The upper eyelid uh, is tends to be dark. Uh, I know some people who put on makeup to make it even darker and more alluring. Uh, 
And so, and there's a shadow cast by the, by the nose here. There's a shadow cast by the hollow of the orbital bone here very often. There's sometimes a little highlight on the cheekbone at this point as the bone sticks out from the skin to make it more. So the eye becomes more and more interesting to look at uh, uh, because it is a series of lights and darks. Eyelashes uh, there make it even more interesting. And just, I would say the most interesting thing is because it's wet, because it sticks out even though it's in the dark hollow of the orbital bone, it attempts, the eyeball, it sticks out into the world, it has to, uh, in order to perceive the world, and because it's washed constantly by tears and is wet. A wonderful thing happens, uh, just when the body is at its darkest, I would say the pupils of our eyes are the darkest possible thing, frequently there's a tiny little uh, sparkle, shall we call it, of light, if I can get this, uh, just to animate the eyeball, uh, to make it even more, if it isn't already jolly interesting, to make it even more exciting. There is that little spark or reflection of a window or the sun or whatever because of the wetness of it. It's so different from the matte, the, the, the uh, quality of our skin round about it. So there we have it, the eye, uh, a wonderful uh, object which is, um, uh, which is so different from the surrounding areas and which we use to express ourselves. So there we are, we talked about the eye and equally expressive are our mouths. And it's very important for us to uh, learn to draw the mouth well. Um, I suppose the most important thing about it is that the mouth is uh, a, a, a slit in our skin which is stretched over the, uh, the bulging maxilla uh, of the upper teeth and to a lesser extent the lower teeth. Um, most of us in this world have got teeth where the if you notice in yourselves, your upper teeth tend to be over your lower teeth. There are some people where naturally, and in relaxed situation, their both upper and lower teeth meet. And there are some people who have lower teeth uh, in front of the upper teeth. But generally speaking, our upper teeth uh, lie over the lower teeth. And they tell me that uh, because of uh, the changes in human diet over the last 40,000 years, this is increasing. We're getting uh, uh, more and more receding chins, I think is how you would say it. Uh, uh, it's to do with our, how we, what we eat, uh, how we eat, and the need we have for teeth, more to grind than to cut. Anyway, that's a, another matter. Um, just remember that the uh, teeth stick out like that and pull the lip with them. I think when we're talking about the mouth, we all sh sh start with the nose, really, because that uh, uh, tends, tends to uh, affect things. So the nose tends to be uh, uh, sticking out and catching the light, but then it tucks away uh, and creates a sort of shadow, generally speaking. Of course, this, this absolute changes when, uh, uh, when the light is shone underneath, and uh, some artists uh, and photographers, I suppose, really like to shine light uh, underneath people's chins to change entirely the way we see the face. And that's a very nice uh, trick, as it were, uh, thing to do. But generally speaking, the nose is dark uh, with light above and dark beneath. And then there's this thing called the philtrum, which is this little hollow there uh, between our uh, nose and the upper lip. And uh, I could put in, not, not everyone has it, when you get older you tend to get more pronounced, this nasolabial fold. And then there is the mouth. Now the upper lip sits on top of your upper teeth and they tend to stick out. And think of this, the lips tend to be pale or rosy uh, uh, in the natural state. They are your internal skin reaching out into the world and curling up uh, uh, to reveal our, uh, our non-porous, non-hairy, 
<laughs> unless you're very unfortunate, in a, cut that bit, inner skin. Uh, so we're revealing our insides to the world. And some people, just look around you, some people show more of their teeth and their gums and their lips than others. Others tend to have uh, thin lips who tend not to show, not to reveal very much of their insides. And it's fascinating to see the variations in how much unfurling, un uh, opening out to the world uh, uh, lips, uh, indivi in an individual's lips can be. Anyway, generally speaking, the lip comes like this and curls upwards to reveal, especially in the upper lip, uh, uh, this uh, shape, this bold shape, because it's attaching, as it were, to the philtrum there. And it tends to be, if the lighting is normal, it tends to be dark, because it, it sticks out uh, into the world. Uh, it's, 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 it sticks out because it's pushed out by the upper, upper teeth, so this catches the light again. And for some lucky people, I think it's very beautiful, there's a sharp division between the pinkish smoothish skin of the lip and the matte skin of our normal face. There's a wonderful thing now that is so characteristic of the human face, unless you have a moustache like that. <laughs> and that is that about here and here, there are two muscles and a little pad of fat very often. Um, so that some lucky people have a permanent little smile uh, a little curl up there, which is very cute, I think, very nice. And, but there's always a little shadow, a little deeper shadow there, uh, and a little fold of skin very often at that point there. But as I say, this is dark because it's away from the light. And sometimes you'll see that sharp divide between upper lip, uh, facial skin, and the upper lip. Then there's the lower lip. It tends to be fatter and fuller, and in some ways, because of the muscles underneath, it's terribly sensitive, a terribly sensitive part of our bodies. Uh, I mean, you can, go to the, you can go to the beach and get one grain of sand, and you, oh, you can feel it terribly, or mm, I can feel one strand of hair from my moustache, and oh, I'm terribly aware of it. It's just a tiny little thing, because we've got so many nerve endings there. We, we, you know a baby will always put things to their mouth to sense the world. We learn about the world through our mouths in some ways. Um, so there tends to be, very often, two pads of muscle there, and the lower lip uh, curls over, uh, sometimes more in some people than others, revealing, as I say, that internal skin and so you'll get this, and here's a, a thing in the body where you're perfectly okay to have lots of wrinkles. The lower lip tends to be uh, wrinkled because we purse our lips all the time. It's also wet, we saw that in the eye, and whenever there's a bit of wet, um, it, it, it's, it, can be, it can catch the light in a particularly delightful way. So whereas the upper lip would tend to be dark, the lower lip would tend to be light and contrast where it meets the upper lip, but then curls away like this into a darker pool like that. Does that make sense? And then there's a little shadow when it comes in. And then we have the chin like this. Sometimes there's that wonderful little uh, 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 division between the two sets of muscle, the depressors on the lower jaw. So there we have uh, the, where we have the setup. And just like in the eye, you have a series of lights, darks, lights, darks, lights, darks, dark, light. Uh, that is if the light is falling down like this. Of course, it's all reversed if, by some peculiar circumstance, you've got light shining up from below. But generally speaking, that's the pattern of the human lip. Before I finish, I'd just like to show this maybe from a side view, because that's all very well from a frontal view. But from the side, you would get something like this. Let's see. You'd have the nose like this, and you'd have that, the front teeth pushing out like that, so the lip would be over the front teeth like this. Uh, there we are. And then let's imagine the person has their mouth open. So there you might see a teeth like that there, and the tongue, oh, well, I won't bother with the tongue. There's the lower lip like this, and there's the chin, something like that. So there we have, 
extraordinary ch change in the geometry of the face when the mouth is open like this here. There's the tongue <laughs> and the lower lip. There we are. Um, when you go on to draw, remember the solid geometry, the added bits of cartilage and skin, our eyes, our ears, our nose, our mouth. The eye itself, very, very different from anything else in the body, really. And a close second is the mouth with its change, change of geometry, ge geometry. It can open wide, it can be closed shut. So it drags the skin with it. And uh, at rest, it is this wonderful series of lights and darks. Thank you.